So the next case that we're going to look at is Abrams v. United States. Now, Abrams v. United States happens the same year as Schenck. Uh, it happens in 1919. And it's only, this case is only really heard a few months after the Schenck case. But something monumentally different has happened. Whereas the previous case was 9-0, unanimous op opinion, this case is 7-2. Furthermore, the author of the Shank opinion, Holmes, is one of the dissenters in this case. Um, he, he dissents along with Brandeis in this case, providing a, a very strong critique of the majority's opinion. Um, and like I said, this is one of those times where I'm going to point you um, towards a dissent as being very important um, for the course of this, for, for, the, for this arc of cases. Um, so what's the background in Abrams v. United States? Well, the defendants in this case uh, printed and distributed a leaflet um, which denounced the U.S. war effort against Germany, and it also denounced German militarism. So it just it was largely anti-war. Um, it was anti-war on both sides. Um, but the leaflet had specific actions that it advised for. It, it advised Russian immigrants in particular uh, to go on a general strike so as not to foster the U.S. war machine. So if Russian immigrants themselves went on strike, then that they could show their opposition to the United States war effort. Um, all five of the defendants, there are five defendants under their Abrams, all five of them were Russian immigrants um, to the United States who had been here for less than five years. Um, and so they distributed these leaflets, they urged other Russians um, to go on strike. Uh, and, and another place, another part of context is kind of important. This is where this case is taking place. Um, in this case, uh, oh, this is not the case that takes place in New York. I'm sorry, that's the next case. Uh, and so we don't have a unanimous opinion this time. The issue is exactly the same as the issue is the case before. Does the distribution of leaflets um, protected action under the First Amendment of the United States? Um, and a majority of the court this time, 7-2, with Justice Clark writing the opinion. Um, it is Justice Clark, isn't it? Again, looking at my notes. Yeah, Justice Clark says, that, no, it's not. Um, they, they uphold the convictions um, based upon the idea that uh, th the risk of the nation is too great. So even though the likelihood is not very high um, that these, these five individuals would actively and, and cause a strike that would hinder the, hinder the war effort, even though that likelihood is not very high, the risk is super high. And that risk would be simply hurting the war effort and hurt, hurting the manufacturing process of the United States. Um, the primary person, this is what the court argues, that the primary purpose of the defendant's action was to defeat the war effort. That was their goal. And especially since uh, the circulation of these flyers was happening in, I was correct the first time around, New York City, um, that the effect here would have been greater had it happened in, say, Peoria, Illinois, if there were five Russian immigrants in Peoria, Illinois, who were circulating um, leaflets that other Russian immigrants in the area should boycott the United States war effort. Big deal. It's Peoria, Illinois for all 20 people that live there. It's, it's a very important thing. But when this happens in New York city, which is quote, the greatest port of our land for which the greatest numbers of soldiers were at the time taking ship daily, then the risk is significantly higher. Uh, Clark goes on to say, uh, it will not do to say that the only intent of these defendants was to prevent injury to the Russian cause. Men must have held to have intended and to be accountable for the effects which their acts were likely to produce. The plain purpose of their propaganda was to excite at the supreme crisis of war, disaffection, sedition, riots, and as they hoped, revolution in this country. So for the court, it wasn't so close to what was likely to occur for the majority. It was more, what would the effect be if it was successful? And since they hoped for revolution as the end goal, 
that risk is very high. So the action that they're seeking is very high, even if the likelihood of it happening isn't that high. The court also makes an important distinction that we, we will revisit uh, in this section. And that's a distinction um, between actions and words. And so that what the court says is that a technical distinction may perhaps be taken between disloyal and abusive language applied to the form of government and language intended to produce like results directed against the United States government. So perhaps simply saying these things probably wouldn't be able to be prosecuted, but they did more than just say. They actually undertook action. They printed up leaflets. They handed them out. They made sure that other people read it. They, they communicated their message effectively, which is something we will come back to. The more effective you are at communicating your message, the more likely it is able to be restricted. So I've got right now 32 of you in this room. If I said some seditionist stuff to the 32 of you listening in, the likelihood that it's going to happen or that I could whip the 32 of you into a frenzy um, to go overthrow the city of El Paso, um, massively unlikely. I'm just saying it. But I also record it. And I also post it on YouTube. And let's say that I also shot it out on Twitter and I put it on Facebook. Uh, and then it started to be shared. At that point, that action that I'm advocating for gets more and more likely because more and more people are hearing it and the message is getting broader. Well, it's that step which these individuals undertook in Abrams, which probably is the linchpin about why the majority said that this restriction could be possible in this case and was legal in this case. One thing that's important to note, the clear and present danger test, that test which was articulated just a few months prior to this case, majority never touches it. So Holmes's test, which he articulated, is not used. Holmes, however, is in dissent. Uh, Justice Holmes and Justice Brennan both dissent. They argue that the leaflets do not present a clear and present danger. They use the language very explicitly, probably to let the majority know that they're not using the only test that currently exists, <clears throat> nor did they actually articulate their own tests. So Holmes and Brandeis say the leaflets do not present a clear and present danger. It is only the present dangers of an immediate evil or an intent to bring it about that warrants Congress in setting a limit to the expression of opinion. Congress certainly cannot forbid all effort to change the mind of the country. But if you're advocating for something, if you're, if you're advocating for an immediate evil, Congress can suppress that. But these leaflets largely were urging a strike and urging, urging opinion change. And Holmes argues that you can't suppress an individual's attempt to change the mind of everyone else. Um, he goes on to state that persecution for the expression of opinions seems perfectly logical. But when men come to believe the very foundations of their own conduct, that the ultimate good desired is better reached by a free trade in ideas, that the best truth is the power of thought to get itself accepted in the competition of the market, and that truth is the only ground upon which their wishes safety can be wishes safely can be carried out. That is ultimately the theory of our Constitution. In essence, Holmes makes the argument that one, this isn't likely to occur. Two, what they're advocating for, ultimately, is a change in opinion and a change in style of government. Well, unless those opinions and theories get tested in the marketplace of ideas, then they're ju that's just suppression of speech. 
the ability to attempt to persuade and change the belief of friends and neighbors and colleagues. That's the essence of what the First Amendment exists to protect. And in this case, that's exactly what Congress is suppressing, is that ability to attempt to persuade. He continues on that, only the emergency that makes it immediately dangerous to leave the correction of evil counsels to time warrants, making any exception to the sweeping command that Congress shall make no law. His, his argument here is that there are very few exceptions under which Congress should be able to quash speech. And that is when there is a direct correlation between a speech happening or speech occurring and a likelihood of evil following it. But in this case, that is not the circumstance. And therefore, this restriction for Holmes and Brandeis is too far, and they would vote against it, which they did. Um, but ultimately, the majority follows in the path of Shank, while simultaneously not using the language of Shank, in again um, quashing and prosecuting individuals um, from advocating uh, for action during war times.